In the age of social media, we often look to people that we admire to keep us informed about the things that matter. But sometimes that influence isn't used for good, and misinformation circulates faster than the truth. In the last year, the conflict with Israel and Palestine have left people globally divided. But my guest today, Noah Tishby, is using her platform to share truth about the conflict and dismantle anti-Semitism once and for all. You're listening to We Need to Talk. So you got something to say that is on your mind. We need to talk, we need to talk about it. You know just one conversation can change your life. We need to talk, we need to talk about it. We need to talk. Thank you so much, Noah, for being on We Need to Talk today. Thank you so, so much for having me. This is great. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking no, the time. No, I really appreciate you taking the time. I really do. I mean, I, I, I do. It's it's kind of, the world is so crazy at this at this point in time. Yeah. And I, I know that I'm not speaking for myself only, but the Jewish community feels so um, um, under attack in so many different ways that it's just like every other community that reaches out to have a conversation is so appreciated. Like I can't even tell you. So. Oh, well, I'm glad. I'm glad to help uh, amplify awareness because it is definitely something that is needed specifically. (laughs) Yes, we need to talk about it. And that's what the whole show is. Exactly. I've been following you uh, for a while now, and I really do appreciate your intentional and factual information Thank you. in regards to Israel, obviously more specifically the Israel-Palestine conflict, because, mm-hmm. you know, we live in a day and age where everybody that has a social media platform is a news source, whether mm-hmm. it's opinion <laughs> or fact, right? Yes. And you you really use your platform in a way that's forthcoming about facts, but you also have the ability to keep emotion out of it. You're very, very factual. So I really do appreciate that mm-hmm. because I think sometimes, you know, emotion does tend to get in the way of truth no matter what side sure. of the spectrum you're on. So for you in using your platform and having these difficult conversations and presenting this information, how have you been able to effectively explain to people that what is happening that may not have sort of a, a comprehensive non-biased overview? Sure. So first of all, um, there is, <laughs> how was I effectively able to uh, make a change? I think that I always joke that I do my work, I do what I do with a cunning use of facts, right? So I I was born and raised in Israel and I moved to the mm-hmm. States in my early, early teens, uh, tw- um, 20s, sorry. And I was shocked to see the misunderstanding and misinformation and how little people know about Israel. And this was pre-social media, the way we, we know it today. But what I saw was something shocking because I saw people had no idea about Israel, nothing mm-hmm. at all but they had very strong opinions. And that was literally in my book proposal um, that I wrote a book about it and we can, we'll talk about this in a second. This was what I wrote. I'm like, I was blown away by the discrepancy between how little people knew about the country and how conviction, like with such conviction, this is the truth about Israel. And I was standing there going, no, it really is not, like not at all. So yeah. it became my life mission to, um, to explain to, to people that Israel is not what they think that it is and to prevent, literally prevent a second disaster coming upon the Jews yet again. And yeah. I think that if people take the time, for example, to let's say, for example, read my book, right? So my book is called Israel, a simple guide to the most misunderstood country on earth. Right. And it's, it's, I saw it was what was missing in, um, in the market was a book that tells the story of Israel in a way that's easy to understand. And it's simple and it's fun. And God forbid, it's even funny sometimes. And it's very personal, <laughs> right? Like it tells the story of the country through the story of my family that helped establish the country. And I know that anybody that takes the time to read and to educate themselves past like 140 or whatever number Twitter allows us to communicate at right now, um, does get, they do get the picture. And I had a lot of people come to me and go, wow, I didn't know this and I didn't know that. And um so I, I do feel like it's it's one person at a time, but again, as humanity, our attention span is short, 
our ability or desire to focus is short. Our amygdala is triggered every single day by sensationalism and lies because that's how the algorithm likes it. So we're all trapped in this loop of, um, you know, horrible, like fake news and hate and rage. And everybody has their own version of that. And what I'm here to point out is that this rage that is now targeting Israel and the Jewish people is as old as the Jewish people. And it's just coming up now in the form of this new online hate and lies and misinformation that I would hope to debunk with you and have your listening, even listeners get a bit more of an understanding of, of what's actually happening right now. You know, it's interesting, though, because in my awareness of the negative perceptions of the Jewish community and how, I guess, prevalent, yeah, that anti-Semitism is now. Oh, yeah. I, I just... I don't even know where these perceptions of the Jewish community came from. Um, and I would love to know if you, in your conversations with people, if you have been able to kind of get back to an origin for people. Wow. Because in the questions that I've asked, I feel like no one's been able to give me an answer. Oh my God, this is great. I love this question. So first of all, let's let's figure out what is, let's, let's talk about what is anti-Semitism. So anti-Semitism in its most simple form is anti-Jewish racism, okay? It's anti-Jewish yeah. racism, so you're racist against the Jews. However, mm -hmm. here's the tricky part about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is both looking at somebody, looking down at someone, and also looking up at someone. So mm -hmm. it's, there's, it's like the anti-Semitism is versus other forms of hate. Um, attributes to the Jews, both the most loathsome and horrible traits, and also the most powerful and the most like cunning and the most whatever. Both these sides exist in the Jew, right? Mm -hmm. Now, anti-Semitism, so anti-Jewish racism has been around for thousands of years in various forms. So yeah. I am obsessed with, with history and there's a particular historian that I love. His name was Josephus Flavius. He lived in, um, in the old land of Israel in Judea and in, in, um, um, at the turn of, you know, the millennial, like in, in 70 AD, basically he wrote this book. He lived, he was, he was a witness to the great Jewish Roman war in which the Jews were, um, uh, the Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews was dispersed in the diaspora. And, um, and he wrote all these books about, it, and this is how we know what had happened at the time, like from, from a historical perspective. Um, when he came to Rome after the destruction of, of Israel, he, in 70 AD, he wrote a book called the antiquity of the Jews. And he wrote that book. It was an epic, like 10 volume book, right? He wrote that book in order to fight pagan anti-Semitism in Rome. Okay, that was mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago. This wow. historian yeah. decided to write a book because he felt like Jews were marginalized in right. Rome in 74 AD. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's how old that is. Now, what hmm. happened with anti-Semitism throughout the you know 2,000 years that have brought us to today is that it keeps transforming. So it's a shape-shifting hate. OK, so what happens is in every generation, the Jew, and this is something that I've taken, it's a, it's a concept that I've taken from an author named um, Yossi Klein Halevi, who is a he, amazing, amazing guy. And I called him up and I'm like, I love this concept. I'm going to run with it. So he identified that throughout history, the Jew, in quotation, right, was used in order to describe whatever it is that's most loathsome in society at the moment. OK, mm -hmm. so throughout, you know, in the, in the early days of Christianity, the Jew was the Christ killer. Right. When there was were plagues, the Black Plague, the Jews were the ones that spread the plague. That was mm -hmm. the, the blood libel at the time. Um, in the days of communism, the Jews were the capitalist pigs. OK, or the communists depends on where. Right. Nazism, yeah. them. The Jew was the race polluter. OK, so in every era in time throughout history, the Jew is representing what's worst in society at that particular moment. The worst thing ever. Now, I mean, I mean, the, it depends in, on who you're asking right, in polite societies in the societies <laughs> that we kind of like what, what's the you know, in, in like, of course. And yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> because you on, on one hand, you would say the worst thing to be in society, quote unquote, is to be a member of a marginalized group. Well, no, that, that's of course, of course, of course. But I'm, I'm, no, 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 I'm, I'm not talking. I'm not talking yeah, that. Of course, that is true. But like in terms of like the perception, a racist, a racist, a colonialist mm -hmm. and 
like be involved in apartheid, right? Yeah. Now notice this. Lo and behold, you people, lo and behold, who's accused of representing all these traits? The Jewish state. And I'm telling you, and I know this is a confronting concept for your listeners. I mean, it may be a confronting concept for your listeners. These things are just not true, but they're being plastered onto Israel as a representation of like, quote unquote, the Jew in the world. Yeah. Okay. Because we all walk around with subconscious biases, right? For sure. We all learn about this. We learn, keep learning about this. Keep, you know, keep growing and learning. So we all have subconscious biases about Jews, okay? The Jews have all the power, the Jews have all the hmm, the Jews are a huh, whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. So when we walk around with these unidentified subconscious biases against Jews, that affects our opinion about Israel, whether we like it or not. So when you hear, when you have a subconscious bias about a Jew, right? And it's not even, you know, I don't hate Jews, they're fine. They just have all the huh, 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 right? <laughs> Right? Yeah, the Jews are bad, right. whatever. And then you hear, yeah, Israel's an ethnic cleansing state. Subconsciously, you go, yeah, that makes sense. Huh. Sure. And that is just, that's as an Israeli and an American yeah. Jewish, a proud American Jewish woman, it's not just infuriating, it's damn straight scary. Yeah. Because yeah. let's debunk the, those like things one by one, right? ethnic cleansing we read about like mark ruffalo right tweets like israel's an ethnic cleansing state and you're like oh my god and you see this everywhere on social media unlike with act like quote-unquote activists right so like right. That's the ethnic cleansing for example like at the establishment of the state of israel in 1948 there were 150,000 um arab israeli palestinians in the state now there are nearly 2 million and they're 21 percent 21.1 percent of the population how is that ethnic cleansing hmm. You see what I mean? Like it's yeah. it's just factually not true. And when it's factually not true, but it's repeated, repeated, repeated on social media by people that we all love. Yeah. You kind of say to yourself, well, maybe that's true. And I'm saying, no, that's anti-Semitism hidden in a different variation of 2020. One of the first things um, I'm sure that you'll agree with is that there's, as you're talking, there's so many parallels to the Jewish struggle to the Black community as well. Absolutely, that's and why we were I'm always, always allies. Support. Yes, and now yes, absolutely, it's absolutely, we've been, we've been divided. Yeah, and it's yeah. horrible. And it the is. Jewish community is. is sitting there being so frustrated, going, "The Black, we felt kin like a kindred spirit with the Black community. We we're always there." And we walk like Rabbi Herschel, like walked on Selma next to like, I mean. Yeah. And even when I was doing research uh, during Black History Month, I always share facts on my social media. One of the things that I didn't know that I found out was that uh, HBCUs were one of the places that Jewish people that fled um, from Nazi Germany were able to find, you know, peace and were welcomed in and they ended up staying there being <laughs> scholars there teaching. And I'm like, oh my God, that is so beautiful. Like, yes. why do we not still have that unity? Yeah. You know, right. and it's, it's, it's frustrating for me because when I see those parallels within marginalized groups, I'm like, why are we not allies. getting together and why are we not stronger allies for one another so that we can take down all of this racism that, that is plaguing us in, in this country? And it's really, really frustrating for me to see that. But the other thing is that I've noticed is that a lot of people in, you know, in regards to the black community as well, they have a lot of ignorance in regards to oppression and the roots of our history and how it's not relevant anymore, right? So I'm sure for you and your community, say people say, well, God, anymore. the Holocaust. Yeah. yeah, the Holocaust <laughs> was a long time ago. You guys are fine. Jewish people are at the top, you know, or slavery was like thousands of years ago, which it literally was not, yeah. but you know what I mean? <laughs> so how do you shut down that kind of commentary that presents oh, yeah. Jewish oppression as being a thing of the past when anti-Semitism is so very clearly on the rise. Because, I mean, in my conversations about black oppression, I'm like, first of all, slavery was not a thousand years of ago. I don't know why you think that, oh right? <laughs> One, my dad was born in 1944 in Mississippi. Do you, you have no idea what that man went through, right? And he's still alive today, right? So it, it's really shocking to me how far removed 
people are from history when it really wasn't that long ago. So I'm just curious how you sort of combat those sort of comments because I'm sure you get them all the time. All the time. So first of all, yeah, slavery was a thousand years ago and there are a (laughs) hundred million Jews in the world too. Right. Right. That's the other thing. The percentage of Jewish people, people don't realize how minimal it is. 15 million Jews all over the world. Yeah. Not in America. All over the world. There are 15 million Jews. Anti-Semitism, so anti-Jewish racism, is Mm -hmm. the oldest form of discrimination, which is still practiced today and has been practiced for thousands of years. Right. So um, and to speak on that. We all know what generational trauma is. Mm -hmm. We all understand what epigenetic trauma carried down means. My my stepmom is a second generation to Holocaust survivor, right? She she was born in Bergen-Belsen in Germany in a in a you know in in a camp, and she until this day packs food underneath the bed basically mm-hmm. packs food all around the house and inserted in the family this fear of like you know there are stories of like of 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 second generations and third generation that sleeps with their shoes on like there is fear that goes down through generations and to come to 2022 and to present the jews as um white passing white privilege and to relate to the Jews as if the Jewish people have been award, awarded the same privileges that white Christians have throughout yeah. history is it's just false. It's false. And it's washing away history, thousands yeah. of years of history of oppression, discrimination, persecution, like hatred, basically every place the Jews went to, yeah, they were, they try to kill them. You know, the, yeah. yeah, it's that whole joke about the Jewish calendar they try to kill us. They did, didn't work. Let's eat. <laughs> mm, I haven't heard that. Oh my every, gosh. Every single Jewish holidays, they try to, that, that's, that, that's, that's the essence of, you know, that's yeah. the essence of, of, of being a Jew around the world. And what's happening today is that anti-Semitic attacks are on the rise. It's the highest that it's been in like 40 years, right? You, yeah. you, you have hate, hatred online is unbelievable. We call it surfing the web while Jewish, Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I post Shabbat Shalom and I get hate on get hate. all right. the time. Right. Right. And yet right. marginalized communities are telling us now, no, 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 no. You don't belong. Yeah. You don't belong. You're, you're white, and, you're privileged. And we're like, what, what just happened? And here's the thing, though, I, 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 and I, do, I think that you'll agree with this. There clearly are white passing Jewish people, right? Yeah, of course. But that if you're only focusing on that aspect of the Jewish community, you're completely erasing all of the people that, you know what I'm saying? The, my there Moroccan, are dark my Moroccan Jews. There Jewish, are, my Moroccan Jewish friends are right. very upset about this. Very right. Upset. So, so if you're only focusing on that aspect of it, then you're really not listening, one, which is the main thing that people need to do. Yeah. And it's really frustrating because you're erasing an entire group within a group of, that sure. those issues are still affecting them. So I think that acknowledging that, yes, there are some white passing Jews that probably if you went outside, you would not know they were Jewish. And I even talked about this um, with Jonah Platt. I don't know if you know who Jonah Platt was. He I was do just it. I listened night. to the... Uh, yeah, uh, he's, he's we talked about this. And to me, that's actually more terrifying. Being a white passing Jewish person, not knowing that you could be around somebody that just has complete hate for Jewish people and then having to hide your identity in that sense. 100%. And 65% of Jewish college kids say that they're fear, American Jewish college kids, they fear for their safety. 50% yeah. of them hide their Jewish identity. Yeah. So we went back in 2022, being Jewish on campus is like being gay in like the 60s. You, you can't you be out. It. You have you to hide it. it. Yeah. Yeah. You have to hide it. And yeah. that, that, is, that is something that really needs to land for anybody that's listening right now. Yeah. Right? Here's the other thing about this, you know, like painting everything by color, right? And, tr- and trying to look at, um, at history and putting it into this intersectionality kind of brackets, right? As it relates to Israel. And, and again, I want your listeners to really listen carefully to this, right? Israel is not a white country. Yeah. I hate having, having these conversations. It annoys me because it's a racist conversation to begin with, but like, mm-hmm. screw that. You have to, because you have yeah. to, okay? We need to talk so, about it. <laughs> exactly. So in 2022, right, 
only 31% of Israeli citizens define themselves as of Eastern European descent. So the rest is either either North African Jews or Arab Israelis or whatever. It's like the, mm -hmm. of, of the quote unquote indigenous to the area. Although all Jews are indigenous to Judea. And again, arguing with that is also weird. But you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jews are originated from the Levant. When we came to Europe, they're like, you don't belong here because you're from the Levant. Now we're here. They're right. like, you don't belong here because you're from, I mean, what the, what the heck? Did you yeah, like, like, you right. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter where we go. It's like, you don't belong here. But now we're in Israel to right. tell us you don't belong here too. What are you talking about? So only 31% of Israelis actually define themselves as of Eastern European descent. All you need to do to know that Israel is not a white country is to go to Israel and walk down the street. It's very apparent. However, social justice groups here are trying to use intersectionality as a weapon against Israel when the premise is wrong to begin with. So they'll come to Black Lives Matter and the Women's March and all these incredible social justice movements and they'll sell them on an anti-Israel agenda using a false mm. premise of intersectionality and white on brown oppression. It's, again, for the Jewish community, we're sitting and watching this like hate that's coming out of Black Lives Matter when we always align ourselves with the black community. And it's just, it's just, it's, it's very scary and it's very sad. And it needs, yeah. it really needs to end. And it goes back to um, an earlier point that you made in regards to celebrities using their platforms mm -hmm. because, I'm, I mean, just being honest, I think like in general, people are lazy in terms of reading yes. and doing research, right? Yep. We're a headline society. That's mm -hmm. just who we are. And we follow people because we trust them. And, you know, the same way people look at our politicians, they look at your pastors, you look at rabbis, whatever. Mm -hmm. you, you look at your public figures mm -hmm. for the truth and you just trust that what they're telling you is correct. And so when you get into those types of movements, there is a responsibility for celebrities and for public figures to present the facts. But that unfortunately is not what consistently happens. Now, I know for you, when you're speaking about Israel and Palestine, you have spoken directly to Bella Hadid, who I know has been uh, one celebrity who has consistently shared um, information without context and without really starting a safe conversation for mm -hmm. people. So how have you, have you reached out to any celebrities that you have seen giving um, misleading information to their followers and try to have a conversation with them so that they are using their platform for truth and safe conversations as opposed to continuing to perpetuate anti-Israel rhetoric? Absolutely. First of all, that's, I, I want to point out to what you just said, anti-Israel rhetoric. I really want your listeners to get that, that like nine out of 10 times, it's anti-Israel rhetoric and nothing more than that, which is it's anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish racism hidden as social justice, which is just virtue signaling and nothing else. And like buying into like anti, you know, to nefarious voices, propaganda. So a lot to unpack there. So I'm I'm about to actually record another video because uh, Muhammad Khadid, Bella and Gigi's father actually called me a liar on Friday. So I think by the time this podcast comes out, the video is already going to be out there. So you guys can go to my, um, my um, Instagram and social media and, and watch it. Um, that particular family is so dangerous with what they spew that I can't even, I, I can't, I don't even know where to begin. Mm -hmm. And it's like our society right now is taking advice on the Middle East conflict from a supermodel, from an LA based supermodel who is ill-equipped to give any of this advice. Now, her father is Palestinian and was born in Israel, by the way, not in you know Palestine. We'll talk about that in a second as well, in 1948. So she has this street cred of being you know, authentically from the region. Mm -hmm. But it's so false. And let me give you an example, right? So she posted on her um, stories one time about the Palestine... Um, soccer team in the Palestine Orchestra. And she said, see, there was a Palestine. We had a state. How great. We had, see, the people who say that there wasn't, right? The Palestine Orchestra was created after World War II by Holocaust survivors, by hmm. Jewish Holocaust survivors who started an orchestra, who ran away from the Nazis and started an orchestra. And now Bella Hadid is using those Holocaust survivors to make a point that doesn't exist. Hmm. I mean, it's just shocking, right? 
Yeah. And here, here's the other thing to, to understand. And again, I'm going to say something that is, it may be confronting for people, but, but, but it's the truth. And I go into it in my book in length, right? There has never been a Palestine as a state. Hmm. Palestine was in reference to a geographical location stretched from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to Iraq and Syria up north, east and north, which was given to the region by the Romans after the great Jewish Roman war in order to disconnect the connection between the Jews and Judea. This is not like, this is just a, a historical fact. Now I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a Palestine, mm -hmm. but there just hasn't been yet, right? So before the establishment of Israel, it was the Arabs of Palestine, the Jews of Palestine, the Christians of Palestine. That's, it was an, a, a geographical location. And now we have Bela Hadid who is crying to free Palestine from the river to the sea, which is effectively calling on ethnic cleansing of the Jews mm -hmm. from their ancestor land. And she looks great while she do it. <laughs> <laughs> she looks so hot. So everybody like, hey, you're like, and that makes me even more upset. <laughs> no, it's like, I'm like, oh my God, we, you know, our historians are on cover of Vogue and they go to the Met Gala and yeah. it's like what people are yeah. listening to now. And it's just really, and again, it's so frustrating because when you take that thread and you pull it all the way back thousands of years ago, you see that it's all the same. Yeah. People just want to believe the worst. And you know, what's also interesting is that, and this is in my own research and conversations that I've had, is when you take away the whatever people's views and perceptions are of the Israel-Palestine conflict, I was actually surprised to find out, and it's not that I thought it was, you know, this dictatorship of a country, but I was actually surprised to find out how progressive Israel <laughs> is you. in, you know, respect <laughs> every, to the rest every, of the Middle of East. Um, and, and, I think, and also in respect to America in many ways. Right, right. I mean, just in conversations with one of my very good friends, you know, just how they were with LGBTQ rights and being able to practice whatever religion mm -hmm. you, you, you believe in and things like that. And I don't think that a lot of the social justice groups and progressive people in this country, and I, I'm very much involved in social justice and, and being a progressive, but I'm also wanting to know the facts and be educated so that I'm not misusing my platform. But I think that a lot of the people in those spaces haven't taken the time to realize that and do that research. Mm -hmm. and, that, and it's upsetting because I do think once you dive in and start reading, there will be a lot of epiphanies for people about how Israel functions as a whole. But for you, could you explain just a little bit about how the Israeli government works for people that are unaware and maybe do have a negative perception of how their government sure. is run? Sure. So first, again, thank you so much for saying that, right? So for example, <laughs> right, Israel never had a don't ask, don't tell policy. So you could be gay in the military. It was like a never a non-issue, right? Mm -hmm. But when this is brought up to social justice warriors in the United States, they go, it's pinkwashing. I'm like, it's not pinkwashing. You're lying about Israel and then you're using, it's just like, it's kind of like a, a vortex you can get out of. So I can curse on TV in Israel. It's a very <laughs> open society. Most oh. politicians have a nickname. Like it's BB and bougie and, you know, it's like a TP and it's a nickname, like, and it's not like disrespectful. It's a very casual yeah. society. It's a very open society. It's a very way more progressive society than it is in various, in a lot of different ways, even to America, definitely to the Middle East, right? I mean, legit in the Middle East, like you, is, you can make out, you, <laughs> the gays have, the gay, I can't, I don't even know where to start with this, right? With gay, with LGBTQ <laughs> rights in Israel, yeah. right? Because it's like gays, they're, they're gays in the military and in government and in every, you know, and, and the government pays for like surrogacy for gays couple. Like it's just, hmm. you know, anyway. Um, the way the Israeli government works is it's a parliamentary system. So there are 120 seats in the Knesset, which is the parliament, the Israeli parliament, and every party that wins uh, the majority kind of gets to create the, the government. Um, there was uh, Bibi Netanyahu, who was the Israeli prime minister um, for like 12 years. He kept winning and winning and winning elections. Um, the, the last, there were the last few couple of years, there were, um, he was unable to form coalition basically. And there were five consecutive elections, but at the end of the, at the end of them, Yair Lapid uh, won the majority on the other side, got the mandate and together with Naftali Bennett, they created a coalition. Um, that particular coalition is how democracy should work, okay? So this, the coalition right now, the government in Israel right now is comprised of right-wing parties, left-wing parties, Arab parties, and in fact, again, to all those people that are calling Israel an apartheid state, 
which is again, an insult to South African apartheid, right? And all the anti-apartheid activists. An Arab party was the one that actually decided if a government will be formed or not, okay? So apartheid, Israel, Israeli Arabs have exactly the same rights as Jews. So you can't call Israel an apartheid state. There are two Supreme Court judges who are Arab Israelis in Israel. 28, 28.1% of, of, of nurses and doctors in Israeli hospitals are Arabs. Like they have every, the same right as Jews. So to call Israel an apartheid state is ridiculous. Again, it's, it's blood libel. It's anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? To say that because it's just factually not true. And that's how the government works right now. And there are people that are, they, they disagree on various things politically, but they make the country work. So when yeah. you look at Israel right now, this is what democracy should, this is what democracy looks like, the Israeli government right now. They decided that you don't agree on I this. I love this history lesson. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Well, I, I just love learning, but you know, you don't know what you don't know, but if you don't listen, then you're never going to know it, right? So I do appreciate you, you sharing all of this. Now, within Israel, you actually have a new role this is the first time that someone's been appointed. So I want you to say exactly what your, your title is and what you're going to be doing with the Israeli government. Yes. So I have, so um, I, I don't know if your, your listeners know, but there's a, um, the American government, uh, the Canadian government, the EU, Germany, Australia, they have a position called Special Envoy to Combat Antisemitism. And uh, Deborah Lipstad was just uh, nominated. She just kind of got confirmed as the United States um, special Envoy to Combat Antisemitism. She's a brilliant scholar, Holocaust scholar. She's incredible. And uh, the State of Israel just appointed me to be uh, Israel's first ever um, Special Envoy for Combating Antisemitism and Delegitimization. It's Wonderful. extremely exciting. Um, it's overwhelming. And um, I hope to continue doing what I'm doing, which is raise awareness for antisemitism and its new forms today and uh, make people kind of stop and think and, and look at their subconscious biases and how it's affecting their positions and their, and their, uh, and their opinions. Um, yeah. It's also the first time that it's on purpose. So Foreign Minister Yair Lapid was the one who combined anti-Semitism and delegitimization because Israel is the only country in the world in which its existence is being questioned. Hmm. And again, think of it, let that, let that land for a second of how is it that the only Jewish country in the world is being questioned on whether or not it should exist? Israel is the only country in the world that has its own Wikipedia entry, the legitimacy of the state of Israel. <laughs> it's the only country, not like North Korea or like Syria or Russia, or, no, just Israel. So this disproportionate obsession that people have with Israel in the United Nations, for example, so in the last... Seven years, I think. Well, oh, I maybe I may be getting that. The last seven years, um, Iran had um, seven UN Security Council resolution against it, and Israel 123. So that the disproportionate yeah. obsession that people have with Israel, and I'm not saying Israel's perfect, right? No country is perfect. No country but is perfect. But we right. look at as I think Jonah and you talked about this as well, right? The policies that we dislike about America right? And all the terrible stuff that America had done throughout the years, nobody's talking about dismantling America. Right. Nobody's talking, there's been, every country had and has terrible policies that we all don't like. Nobody likes kids in cages and the borders, but we're not saying let's dismantle America for this. Right. Yet it is said about Israel yeah. without care from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, globalize the intifada. Intifada was a popular uprising in which Palestinians exploded themselves in buses on the streets of Tel Aviv near my house where I woke up and the bus that I would take had like 22 people killed in one, in one explosion. That's the intifada that now social justice warriors are calling to globalize. How is this a progressive movement? Hmm. You know, I saw right, it's a quite video. Frustrating. I'm clearly quite frustrated about it. Well, you I mean, I think your frustration is is absolutely warranted. Um, and you know, it's 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 difficult to feel like you know the truth, you know the history, and you're having you're willing to have these conversations, but so many people 
hear one version of it and then that's just what they run with right and it's I mean it is a very nuanced and, and complicated situation and if people really care I think that they would take the time mm -hmm. to talk and learn and and figure everything out and I recently saw this uh, video of an Israel activist I think his name was Rudy Rochman or mm -hmm. Rockman yeah, yeah 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 and he gave such a beautiful explanation of of the entire conflict and at the end he said you can be pro-Israel and pro-Palestine oh, simultaneously. And so, yeah, I just wanted to get your your ideas and your, your response to that because it was such a beautiful sentiment how he, how he spelled it out. And I'm like, I was sharing it with so many people, like, please watch this, please watch this. Now, of course, you can lead a horse to the water. You can't make them drink it, right? So I don't know if they did, but yeah, I just wanted to, to hear your response to that. I love this. I say this in my book all the time, pr pretty much from chapter one. So to try and, and create this as a either or, as you know, you're either pro-Israel or pro-Palestine is again, um, nefarious voices that are trying to dismantle Israel. This is not the case for literally no Israeli that I know or that exists, right? I'm sure there's like a handful of Israelis, just like a handful of people that hate blacks and Jews and, da, 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 and Arabs and whatever. Right. They're going to be everywhere. The fringes yeah. of yeah. whatever, the crazies. Yeah. But that just is not true. So the interesting question to be, so obviously I'm pro-Israeli and pro-Palestinian, a hundred percent on both, right? The question to why there hasn't been a Palestinian state yet, it's too long of an answer to give right now, but cannot and should not be laid at the hands of Israel only because it's not factually and historically true because there have been many opportunities throughout the years in which the Jews before the extent the, the, the creation of Israel um, were talking about creating a, a, a state and sovereignty for the local Arabs, the United Nations and the partition plan um, in 1947, partition plan one, uh, resolution 181 gave the mm -hmm. Arabs a state and they said no. Throughout the years, there have been many offers for an Arab Palestinian state and they kept saying no. I know it's hard to hear, but that's the truth. Hmm. So where is the responsibility? Again, too long of an answer right now, but look into it and be careful in what you, in what, in, in your conclusion that is automatically anti-Israel. So obviously the majority of Israelis are pro-Israelis and pro-Palestinians. We just hate Hamas. We just don't like the terrorist organizations right. that are promoting Sharia law which is yeah. non-conducive for human development. Like Sharia law needs to be something that every progressive fights against because it's it's a it's a it's an embodiment and a state-sponsored rape culture. Mm. And I mean it's a horrific culture. Right. Sharia law is what's causing the women of Afghanistan right now to be covered again. They were just the Taliban just had them, the women covered again, fully from head to toe. But we're not hearing Bella Hadid saying anything about that. Right. That's oppression of Arabs by Arabs. What why yeah. are you not why are you not yelling about that? No, because it's always against Israel. That is the culture that we're fighting against. We're not fighting yes. against the Palestinians. We're fighting against a culture that is specific, right? Not the entire Palestinian population, but Hamas is a terrorist genocidal organization that wants to kill all the Jews and oppress right. all the women and kill all the gays. That's just what they want. They're not it's not yeah. hidden. So yes, I'm pro-Israeli and pro-Palestinian. Yes, 100%. absolutely. So when you take away, you know, people following celebrities and that's all they're listening to, what resources do you think people should really, you know, put their attention towards so that they are getting the right information and armed with the right facts? First of all, stay out of social media. <laughs> so I'm not kidding. It's, it's, it's yeah, been, yeah, in yeah. May when the conflict with the war with Hamas happened, um, it was heartbreaking to see what's going on so yeah. there, there were all these memes and these cartoons of is israel a state or is it a colonialist endeavor right all these and by the way let me debunk the colonialist state as well israel is not a colonialist state it's literally a refugee state that was decolonized from great britain mm -hmm. <laughs> like literally yeah but to call it a colonialist it's like again what are you talking about right so yeah. first of all, stay off of social media, um, unless you, there are a couple of accounts that are actually that are actually good. There's a, an account called the Wider Frame 
which is great. Um, that gives all the information of what's happening and truthfully and in, in, in time. There's an account called stopantisemitism.org, which is also great. I I listen to a left, right, and center. So I'll, I'll read the New York Times oh, and I'll watch Fox News, right? And NPR. And like, I actually tape a bunch of the extreme Fox News shows in order to know what's happening to get the, the, the other side perspective as well. Um, and I have the privilege of being able to read Hebrew. So I read a lot of Israeli news to know what's actually happening behind, you know. So when they talk about the riots in Al-Aqsa, these riots started because radical Palestinians have barricaded themselves inside the mosque and started throwing rocks and firecrackers and prevented Palestinians from actually going in and exercising their religious freedom. Mm. But then, so then the Israeli police had to intervene because there were riots and firecrackers and everything. And then Bella Hadid only shows the Israeli police like intervening. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God. It's like, that's when you need context. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I'm not here to say that Israel is a perfect country. I don't want it to come across that way. Every country has policies that are not great. For sure. Just watch your perception about vil vilifying that one state, demonizing that one state, thinking that that one state is the worst in the world. Mm -hmm. it isn't. And that's your subconscious, con you know, subconscious bias. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just so grateful that you you took the time to chat with me and to share with my listeners. I, I appreciate your voice and all that you're doing. Can you let everyone know, one, where they can get your book, but also where they can follow you? Because you do some really great posts that I think people need to hear. So th first of all, again, thank you so much for having me. I, I can't tell you, I'm like, we feel we feel so under attack that every time somebody reaches out, we're like, thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you. Um, Follow me at Noah Tishby, N-O-A-T-I-S-H-B-Y um, on all social medias. My preferred one is, is Instagram. Um, and you can get my book anywhere you buy books, Amazon. So put in Israel Wonderful. and it comes out. It comes out. Wonderful. Real simple guide. Thank you so much, Noah. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really do. Thank you, Linda.